Hello audience, it's Trev. Today we're talking about Jujutsu Kaisen. So if you're anime only, be careful, but I will warn you before I start talking about manga spoilers. So feel free to stick around until I give that warning. Today we're talking about Jujutsu Kaisen, everyone's favorite anime or manga. <laughs> okay, if JJK is your favorite anime or manga, I'm not your enemy, okay? I'm making this video because I do care about JJK. If I just hated it, I would not be talking about it. But I have my complaints. I'm sure everyone has some complaints about JJK, right? I'm sure I, I know I'm not the only one. So, you know, if you're looking at this thinking, wow, this guy made a rant about another anime he hates again. No, okay? Listen, <laughs> I get it, but we're on the same side here. Let's start with talking about season one of the JJK anime. If for some reason you don't want spoilers on season one of the JJK anime, this is your time to leave. I'm warning you now. Uh, yup. Oh, 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 you got spoiled. Okay, I don't know why you would stick around if... Yeah, whatever, let's, let's get to the point. So, let's lead with some positivity. This anime, season one, gave us some absolute bangers. Everybody just talk, nobody really do it. Aside from the amazing music, there's plenty of other good things to say about this as well. Like, for example, the premise of the show itself is very exciting. The hook, the first episode being, oh, this guy ate a finger of a curse. Like, starting with the execution, like, so early in the show, the execution concept, uh, just leading so early with Gojo, you know? Like, just, it does a very good job of grabbing your attention immediately and making sure you're interested in what's going to happen next. Another positive is how good the protagonist cast of season one is. Like, of course you're leading with Gojo, who just constantly steals the show whenever he shows up, right? But then, also, Nobara, Megumi, and Yuji are all also very likable characters. And then there's Junpei, who, while, yeah, he dies, but his death creates a, a big emotional impact on us very early on in the show, because he's also a very likable guy for the time he's around. And of course, there are a bunch more likable char uh, characters who are more minor, some of which I listed here, some of which didn't make it on, like, Panda and Inumaki. But, you know, they're cool too, and if you like one of them, then you're gonna enjoy season one. Looking forward to seeing that character have cool scenes. The villains are also not slacking here. We have Jogo, who is a very... Okay, well, yeah, Jogo in season one does get kind of dog-walked by Gojo, but it's also... that's also Gojo. L listen, J Jogo is cool when he's being a horrible, like, cursed spirit. Bam, blowing up a f kitchen or whatever, like... I, I vaguely remember that scene, but, you know, Mahito is very hateable for obvious reasons, Rip Junpei. Uh, you have Hanami, who is a very, who has a very cool fight against two very likable characters, Toto and Yuji. And, okay, you don't see that much of Ghetto here. I don't, I sh probably shouldn't have included him on this slide specifically, but he ends up being cool later. And, of course, how can you not talk about Ryomen Sukuna? I would honestly say I think Sukuna carried J season one of JJK, even though he's far from the character with the most screen time or the most cool moments. He's really awesome. When he shows up and utterly demolishes that one curse that's from his finger in the school or whatever, that scene is amazing. When every time he switches with Yuji, you, your, your heart is in your throat. You're like, oh, what is this guy going to do now? He tears out Yuji's... He literally kills Yuji. He, no, this, this, guy is, this guy is a menace. The first thing he says when he wakes up is, where are all the women and children? Like, you know, you get the idea. He makes the show a lot more interesting, in my opinion. I actually don't have that many negative things to say about G season one of Jujutsu Kaisen. It was overall a very wonderful experience for me. The only two things I will point out are one, that sometimes it felt the plot was moving a little bit slowly, occasionally. However, that's excusable because we're still getting to know the characters at this point. And the characters are more than likable enough to carry the show on their own when the plot isn't doing much. You know, the only other criticism I would have is that, yeah, some of the villains, even though they're cool, don't get the chance to do much because Gojo exists, right? It is what it is, and they will get their time to shine later on. And now, one more thing that is neither a good nor a bad thing, just something that I want to point out and one opinion that I have, is that when you're telling a story... The beginning is very important, not just because it introduces the world, it introduces the characters and the plot, but I think it introduces what readers should expect, or what viewers, in this case if you're watching the anime, should expect from the show. In season one of Jujutsu Kaisen, 
we get a lot of things. There is brutal... Okay, I'm not here to say that season one of Jujutsu Kaisen is not as dark as Shibuya, right? Plenty of terrible stuff happens in season one of Jujutsu Kaisen. However, there are still some expectations that are set by the first season. For example, how we see the characters interact with each other. This can change throughout a story, of course, but without good reason, no, not really. Usually you get good reasons for when character dynamics and whatnot change, right? Second of all, a bit of the pacing. Yeah, I did complain about the plot being slow, but that came with positives. Positives being that you get to see how the characters react to things. You get to see the characters' relationships with each other and know them a lot better. It's, it's nice, you know? It's wonderful, especially in the beginning when you're being introduced to people. So I just wanted to point that out. I think the season one of JJK sets some expectations, and if you're going to stick around for season two and the manga discussion, keep that in mind for later. Let's quickly discuss JJK Zero, the movie. Um, I mean, it was fine. I didn't, I didn't hate it. I didn't really love it either. Yuzo's cool, but he's far from my favorite character in this series or anything. And, okay, one thing I'll point out is, yes, this is kind of required viewing, because there are some things in this, <laughs> this movie that aren't explained very much when they become relevant later on in the plot, and I know some people who were left kind of confused after, you know, skipping the movie and continuing on with the show. So that is something worth pointing out. But other than that, it was fine. It was nice to see some more screen time of some characters like Maki and Gojo and Inumaki. But yeah, I mean, that's about it. Now, spoilers are coming up for specifically the part of Season 2 called the Hidden Inventory Arc, which covers Gojo and Geto's backstory. So if you don't want those spoilers, click away now. This is your warning. So yeah, first of all, <laughs> we got to talk about the banger. Second of all, you may have noticed that when I pointed out the characters who I liked uh, uh, getting screen time in JJK Zero, I left out Ghetto. And that's because I think that none of Ghetto's screen time in that movie can even hold a tiny candle to Ghetto's screen time in Hidden Inventory. His backstory, uh, oh my goodness, I went into this arc knowing nothing, or knowing next to nothing about Ghetto and barely caring about him. I left this arc and he was my favorite character. The character development they showed for him was absolutely fantastic. Making us care from zero to a hundred about a, a villain, a, a major antagonist, no less. It was masterful writing. I think it was super well done. It was, the pacing was phenomenal. I was gripped the whole time. I think Hidden Inventory Arc of JJK might be some of the, my favorite anime I've ever watched. It was fantastic all around. And not just Ghetto either. I, I know I just, you know, talked about Ghetto for all this time, but it's not just him. There's Gojo, of course. <laughs> Gojo was also very likable in this. Uh, we got a lot more insight on him as a character. He did have more screen time before this. However, Gojo's screen time in season one is just him being cool, blowing stuff up, and, you know, being a sensei sometimes when he felt like it. <laughs> you know, and Gojo is that kind of guy. But this time is where I started really caring about him as a person much more than I did in season one, and I guess also JJK Zero. This arc was very important for fleshing out two characters who are crucial to this show. And honestly, I almost forgot, but you can't talk about the hidden inventory arc without talking about Toji. What a good antagonist. Absolute menace. He was fantastic. You would think, hey, it's Ghetto and Gojo, two of the strongest sorcerers of our era. Even as kids, they were busted. What is... Oh, what is one guy with no cursed energy going to do? And, well, he shows you. You know, I love Mr. Bag Chaser Toji, and he really, really helps out this part of the anime, in my opinion. With that said, now we're going to move on to the rest of Season 2, or the Shibuya Incident. So, if you don't want spoilers, click off now. I'm not playing around. I'm not playing around. Oh, oh, you got spoiled. Oh, you got spoiled. Oh, I told you, I'm not playing around. Starting off in this arc... We have Mechamaru, which is an interesting choice. Let's talk about him real quick. So, here's what here's some things. I did like Mechamaru. I think he was a cool and interesting character. And I think his presence throughout the arc was really helpful as, you know, a kind of an exposition dumper sometimes. But, you know, he was cool. His conflict with being healed by curses because that's the only thing he could think of. You know, he makes for a very interesting guy, a very compelling character. And he has a very uh, big and cool fight. However, there are some things that I don't, I didn't like that much about it. Um, if you, if you look at, if you look at like where the fight 
with Mechamaru and Mahito and like his whole healing and stuff was placed in the anime is right after they hit an inventory arc. We're going from Ghetto and Gojo into Mechamaru, who is someone who we don't know yet, really. Like, we know he exists. We know we have like a few glimpses from season one, but nothing huge. And just going straight into something like a big fight between him and a, a major antagonist of the series, it's like, you kind of know he's going to die. There's there's no way that Mechamaru, of all people, is going to win uh, the fight against Mahito and also Ghetto, who's just standing there. <laughs> like, it's it's not it's not fair to him. And those few episodes just kind of felt like, okay, well, nice knowing you, Mechamaru, <laughs> but he's cooked, right? So one thing I would have changed is I did really like the idea of putting those little, like, Mechamaru chips into the, like, with the characters in the Shibuya incident itself and having him talk to them through that, what I would have done is not show the fight, not show the talking or anything, but instead what I would do is just go straight to the Shibuya incident, have him talking to the characters there, and then that's giving him more screen time. We're getting more attached to him, and we can see the other students, the other, uh, like, Miwa, um, the girl who rides on the broom, the, uh, what's his name? Noritoshi, the blood, the blood sorcerer. You know what I mean, those guys, right? It would have been nice to see them, you know, interacting with Mechamaru a little bit more. And then, at the end of the arc, when the little chip things, batteries or whatever, were running out, he could say, hey guys, this is what happened to me, this is why I wasn't present when you guys looked for me, and then explain, oh, I fought Mahito, <laughs> you know, I, he healed me, and I also immediately threw hands. Like, that would have made the fight have a lot more emotional impact, in my opinion, and made me like him a lot more as a character, rather than, you know, just killing him first and then doing the rest later. All right, now guess who gets sealed into the prison realm in this arc? Yup, it's our favorite uh, white-haired sensei, Gojo Satoru. Just kidding, you're not my favorite white-haired sensei. <laughs> I like Akashi better. Yeah, it's still Gojo's final fight before being sealed for an unspecified amount of time. It should be epic, right? It should be epic. I'm not saying this fight is trash, okay? Do not mistake me for saying this fight is trash because it has some amazing moments in it. When he walks towards Hanami and blows Hanami into a wall and obliterates them. Insane. Actually insane. When he uses his domain for a split second to immobilize everybody and then uses that time to take out the transfigured humans. Amazing moment. Like, right. This is all amazing. However, I think this part of the anime had some pacing issues. Some pretty significant pacing issues. Because, you know, for a lot of the fight, I was just kind of like, I mean, these curses are just kind of running around shooting Gojo and hiding behind people. It wasn't particularly interesting of a fight to me, except for those few moments I mentioned. Which is a shame, because this is Gojo's last fight before he gets put in a box. I thought it should be way more epic. And especially seeing the effort put into some of the other fights in this arc, it really makes me feel ashamed, because this fight did not impress me that much. It's one of my least favorite fights in the arc. Now, one thing that definitely did not help this fight earn, earn any points in my book is uh, Ghetto revealing that, hey, I'm not Ghetto anymore, I'm Evil Brain Man, and <laughs> sealing Gojo in the prison realm. Um, like, okay, like, <laughs> how do I explain this? Like, when we first learn about the prison realm, let's not pretend the prison realm is anything but a convenient plot device to put Gojo away so that the other characters can actually be in danger, right? It is what it is, but... You know, when it was first introduced, I was like, oh, I look forward to seeing how they're going to make Gojo Satoru stand in the range of this prison realm for long enough to get sealed. And then what did they do? Oh, it's, he has to be locked in there in his mind. So if he thinks of something that happened in the past, it will cover those past times. And he'll be instantly what is this? Like, complete nonsense last minute reveal. It was, it was frustrating. It was dissatisfying. And to top it off, we get, oh yeah, Ghetto is no longer Ghetto. He's evil brain man. <sighs> We just spent Hidden Inventory becoming attached to Ghetto, seeing, oh wow, this is a really cool character. I look forward to seeing his ideals portrayed, his relationship with Gojo, you know, his very interesting relationship with Gojo portrayed, and his his relationship with his followers and humans as a whole portrayed in the future of the series. And, oh yeah, no, that character, oh, that character's in the trash now. Now we have evil brain person. It's... Uh, it's frustrating. It's dissatisfying. This evil brain person does do cool stuff later in the series that makes me like them as well. But I desperately wish that they had come back as a separate entity and not in Ghetto's body. 
Ghetto does, you know, strangle himself when he's fighting back against uh, the brain person. So there's something there. Ghetto could still be in there, but we'll talk about that later if it comes up. Here is another severe disappointment I had with this arc. Toji versus Megumi. Ah, oh, I, ooh, I really take issue with this. I've talked to people who say they like it, and they give reasons I understand, right? They say, oh, it really showcased the gap between Megumi and Toji. Fine, I guess so. They say, oh, it showed that Toji, at the end of the day, still cared about his family. I mean, I, I guess, right? But in my opinion, right, Toji in the Hidden Inventory arc was a complete menace. Like, like I said, this guy was pulling up on children and shooting them in the face and saying, yeah, give me my money. Right after he's resurrected, what does he do? He jumps into Dagon's domain, flies towards Dagon, and eviscerates Dagon. It's, it's insane. It's awesome, right? However, <laughs> like, you're gonna build up Toji's revival as, oh yeah, the man who left it all behind. Left it all behind! And, oh, he's being driven by nothing but the desire to fight. The desire to punch up the strongest person there or whatever like you know it's like oh wow toji's back he's gonna mess things up what's his second fight after coming back and eviscerating dagon his son okay what happens oh he literally takes himself out it's toji it's toji toji is one of the most selfish characters in all of jujutsu kaisen <laughs> why is he taking himself out but i get that sure maybe he cares about megumi but to the point of taking himself out? Really? Really? That's that's surprising to me. That's very surprising to me. And people say, oh, this is displaying the soft side that he had. And it's like, sure, but they don't do anything with this moment either. Like, there's no flashback saying, oh, yeah, I actually cared about you even though I had to abandon you for, you know, the sake of my job. They're, they don't say, oh, you remind me of your mother. I don't know, man. Like, I'm trying to help Toji out here. But... If he cared, he should have made it more clear. And the worst part is, how are you going to have a father-son fight in an anime? And the father and son aren't even on good terms anyways. And then you're not going to make the son realize that he was fighting his father? Are you serious? They barely talk in this fight. They, they barely converse. Like, it's just, it's just whatever Toji says at the very end before, you know, offing himself. I think it's the most insane wasted opportunity of all time. This, this fight was just super frustrating to me as a big fan of Megumi and a big fan of Toji. Now, if you've watched this arc, you know a lot of crazy stuff happens. Nanami gets blown up. Jogo gets burnt to a crisp. Toto loses his arm. Gojo gets sealed. Maki gets burned up. Naobito gets burned up. Who's the other person? I mean, Nanami also got burned up, but he was fine <laughs> until, you know. And Nobara gets her face blown in half. Like, yeah, a lot of stuff happens in this arc. Let's quickly talk about what that means for the future of Jujutsu Kaisen. If you remember what I said earlier in when we were talking about season one of the anime, I said, yeah, in the first part of Jujutsu Kaisen, they set some expectations for the show. And they say, hey, this is the kind of pacing we're going to have. This is the kind of characters and like, this is the thing you should look forward to. And one of those things I look forward to the most is character development. Character development, the relationships between the characters, you know, Yuji, Nobara, and uh, Megumi are very fun to, you know. But... Yeah, here, just everything gets flipped on its head. A bunch of characters get blown up, taken out. Just, it's cra crazy stuff in this arc, right? I don't think all of it was necessary. I think a lot of it was just Gege getting carried away and having fun blowing up his characters. Honestly, like, that's the, that's the best explanation I can give. Because, yes, Yuji's character development from this part of the show is very powerful, right? Okay, wait, first let me, let, let me cover something. Yeah, Gojo had to be sealed. I mean... You can't really progress the story more without getting rid of Gojo for some time. So yeah, they had to seal Gojo. I That's fine. That's not what I'm complaining about here. But if you look at all the other people who got blown up or whatever, like, I don't think it was all necessary. Because, like, okay, let's let's talk about Yuji and Sukuna, right? If you, I mean, one of the most iconic and good moments in the entire arc was Yuji having a breakdown after Sukuna switches back after, you know, massacring Shibuya. It's an amazing moment, and it's like, wow, this is the character development that Yuji got. And then right after that, he goes down and sees, oh, what what, what now? Oh, Nanami gets blown up right in front of his face. Terrible. Terrible moment for Yuji. Absolutely horrible. And then what happens? Nobara gets blown up right in front of Yuji. Oh, another terrible moment. Was it all necessary, though? I don't think it was all necessary. Because Yuji has already experienced enough pain to go through the character development that happens in the future of this chapter. 
honestly, I don't even think Nanami dying was necessary, but if you just want to rub it in, yeah, sure, I guess. But Nobara feels completely unnecessary of a death to me. I, I mean, yeah, okay, I guess she's still, oh yeah, she's maybe alive, but we'll talk about her possible return in the future. But that aside, I don't think it, taking her out of the story at this point was a good move on Gege's part. I think it would have been a lot more interesting to see their dynamic and how she and Yuji would have dealt with their own friendship in the aftermath of such a terrible event. We still get some of this with like Megumi, but that's another thing we should talk about in the future, right? The, the thing I do want to say is that the Shibuya arc really breaks a lot of the expectations that I mentioned were built up in Season 1. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, I just think you have to do it for a reason. So keep that in mind if you stick around for us talking past the Shibuya arc. However, I still did overall enjoy my experience with the Shibuya arc, despite whatever complaints I've given up to this point. Like, the fights were incredible, a lot of very good fights, a lot of time and effort put into by the animators, Mappa, please treat your animators well. But yeah, it was clear that there was a lot of time and effort put in. And of course, we can't not talk about the banger. Keeping all those things in mind, let's move on to talking about Jujutsu Kaisen's manga. If you don't want manga spoilers, you should leave now. Now, if you're not fully caught up to the manga, I will be spoiling things that you have not seen yet. This is your last warning. Please leave. Why are you still here? Why are you still here? Leave, leave, leave. No. Oh, you got spoiled. Oh, you got spoiled. I'm not playing around. I'm not playing around. I told you. All right. So let's dive right into it with my biggest complaint about the entire manga as a whole. This show just does not let the characters breathe, man. Like, I get it in the Shibuya incident because it's a, you know, it's an action scene where a bunch of stuff is happening. But then, like, there's so much time in the manga that passes, and just, we never get to see the characters talking to each other like they did in the first season. We never get to see them, you know, actually bonding, taking some time to, like, reflect on their, their selves and their actions and the things that have happened to them. None of that. It's just the plot wheel keeps spinning. You gotta get in the next fight, buddy. Oh, Megami, uh, Su, Yuji, guess who's coming to kill you now? Oh, no. Oh, guess what your next mission is? Go to the calling games. Go to the, oh, everything, everything. Oh, you just gotta keep going, keep going, keep going. And it's like, there's just no time to really capitalize on a lot of the really cool seeds that have been planted in the earlier parts of JJK. It just feels like, oh, we're moving on to the next cool fight. Another thing worth talking about is how many new characters are introduced. And, I mean, don't get me wrong, I really like some of these characters. Like, there are some of these characters who are really cool, like, you know, Takaba is awesome. I really like, uh, what's his name? I mean, I can, I can just say it now, I, I like Kenjaku as his own character. He was introduced in Shibuya, but, you know, we really learn more about him in the manga itself. So, yeah, Kenjaku's awesome. Um, I really like Higuruma. He's, he's a really cool guy, and the parts that were focused on him were very entertaining and interesting. You know, the point is, there are a lot of cool characters in the manga, and even more that I really like the concept for, like Kashimo, like Megumi's sister, potentially, like Angel, like Hakari, you know? A lot of cool things going on here, but it just feels like wow, the, the, the wheel keeps spinning, you gotta keep moving, you gotta keep moving, you're introducing these new characters, and it's like, just everything's happening, and it's just, you don't really get time to sit back and think about it. Let's talk now about Yuta Okotsu, and his declaration upon being reintroduced back into the manga slash anime, I will kill Itadori Yuji. A very stunning declaration, and everyone who has watched JJK Zero and knows Yuta says, No, you aren't, you liar. <laughs> Obviously, there's something fishy, right? If you know Yuta, they, he would not do that, right? So, I think one thing that would have made that scene and the entire following part where Yuta is hunting down Yuji a lot more thrilling, a lot more high stakes, is making it clear when Yuta says that, that it's a binding vow. Because it was a binding vow. He actually came and he actually killed Yuji. So... You know, I think revealing that at the beginning would have made us really be like, oh crud, this guy's actually saying, you know, he, he's committing to killing Yuji right now. What's happening here? That would have really shocked me a lot more than, I, you know, I heard from a lot of people that they smelled something fishy as soon as Yuji, I mean, Yuta said that. So, you know, I think that would have drastically improved the stakes for that portion. Anyways, back to what I said about, you know, character development throughout the rest of the manga. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that there's none, right? There's some. There's definitely some, like Higuruma versus Yuji. Yeah, of course, there's that moment. The the scene where he says, oh yeah, I killed those people and accepts the guilty verdict. 
is a very powerful one because it reveals to us right there and then what Yuji thinks of himself as a person, the actions that happened in Shibuya. It's a very powerful scene. And yeah, there are some moments like that throughout the manga. However, the point is that they're very few and far between. That said though, let's talk about how good the antagonists are in the manga. Sukuna and Kenjaku are an amazing duo of amazing antagonists. Just, like, I've already talked about how awesome Sukuna was in Season 1. He continues to be a menace when he comes back in the manga. Man, when? <laughs> when Sukuna said and chained and turned into Megami, oh my goodness. I was losing my mind. An absolutely insane moment. And, you know, the, just the kind of diabolical thing you would expect from the King of Curses, right? And just his fights later on, like, against Gojo and stuff. Oh, good stuff. But also Kenjaku, very underrated antagonist. I kind of don't like that he replaced an interesting character. Like I said, he replaced Ghetto. And now that, you know, anime onlys are gone, Ghetto never came back. What was the choking moment for? There's nothing. Kenjaku's literally beheaded right now. He's not, con like... Ghetto is dead dead, and that was literally just bait. Whatever. But, okay, that aside, Kenjaku is cool. If he'd come back as not Ghetto, he would be one of my favorite characters. And, you know, he's always pulling some crazy stuff. He talks a lot, which I find very endearing. It's, there's literally one panel where he says, I have not finished speaking, and then continues to yap and give some random exposition. It's, <laughs> he's a very entertaining guy to me. And when he summoned the American military, for example, like, it's just, like, what am I talking, this is Jujutsu Kaisen? He summoned the American military, like, oh, crazy stuff happening with Kenjaku, really big fan of him. However, I will say, some of the things in the calling games, ah, uh, whatever, man. Like, Kenjaku, I get that the calling games were something cool, but, like, something related to his idea, you know, kind of plays into the end of the manga, perhaps, but... Yeah, just, I don't like the result that we got from it. The arc itself was not that particularly interesting to me. There were some cool ideas, like reincarnated sorcerers from the past. Wow, that's so cool. Oh, we can learn a lot of stuff about the past era of Jujutsu sorcery. We can have some cool interactions with them and the new characters. No, they're just here to have cool fights. Like, come on, it's just cool fight Kaisen at this point. Like, give me interesting things. Like, Angel had one of the most interesting character dynamics with the revived sorcerer. Like, Yorozu slash Tsumiki, Megumi's sister, could have been such a cool character, you know? Like, oh, faked out Megumi, like, I would I would love to see how that impacts Megumi in the future. No, Megumi is now Sukuna. Megumi is curled up in a ball in Sukuna's brain, crying because he got literally domain expansion by Gojo five times or something. Like, just, there's so much potential for good character moments, good writing moments that involve, like, interactions between them, and it's just all being thrown in the trash one after another. It's it's a really crying shame. A Kashimo? Oh my goodness. We'll get back to Kashimo. But you get the idea. Just cool ideas being tossed in the garbage left and right in this manga. I will say, though, two sorcerers who I really did enjoy are Higuruma and Takaba. They both got some really cool backstory moments later in the manga. They both were, you know, they're very enchanting and captivating characters when they're on screen. They're fun to watch, right? So I'm a big fan of these two. But it really bothers me that Gege can't do this for other characters who have been with us for longer and instead does it with these two. Like, don't get me wrong. Uh, like I said, I have love for these characters. But I had more love for characters who I actually knew before the Culling Games. You know what I mean? Like, this just feels like this is great, but why didn't we get it elsewhere? And if I'm talking about Miss Potential, I cannot not talk about Nobara. Why did Gege even say, oh, she might come back? She's, she has barely even been mentioned since she died. Like, I guess there's a possibility that she survived, and let's be real, that's probably the more likely thing, because why would Gege say there's a possibility and then not elaborate? Unless she's alive, right? But the possibilities at this point for Nobara are very disappointing to me. Like, the possibilities are pretty much just, hey, either she uses resonance on Sukuna's finger and strikes a critical blow against Sukuna in the final battle, or, I guess, Yuji and Megumi, if Megumi survives, visit her after the aftermath of everything, and she's getting better. Like, if she's alive, those are the two options, neither of which I think are particularly interesting, especially if Gege is going to troll us by not mentioning it at all, even when there are plenty, plenty of opportunities to do so. But it is what it is. Like, if you're a Nobara fan, I'm so sorry for you, because you're just going to be sitting here waiting for something to happen for a gajillion chapters, and nothing's going to happen. 
Until, oh, I can't wait for her to say, oh, resident strike on Tsukuna. I may be, i face blown off, but it's okay. Choco healed me. Oh, resident, I don't know. Like, some lame stuff is going to happen. Whatever. It's, that's fine. Now, let's talk about Gojo versus Tsukuna. But first, we have to talk about something else. The time period between Gojo getting unsealed and the start of the fight between Gojo and Tsukuna. From November 19th or something to December 24th. There was a time skip there. Things happened in that time skip. But we don't get to see any of it. Actually insane writing strategy to me. I have no idea what Gege is doing. So many things that could have happened in that time that we could have seen. I was When that happened, I, when Gojo said, let's fight on December 24th, or if it was Sukuna, I don't remember, whoever said it, I was, I was breathing a sigh of relief. I was thinking, oh, so many of these things that I missed in the manga that I think are blank spaces left, finally, we're going to have a chance to revisit some of these. We're going to see perhaps whatever Yuki was researching in her notebook or what i don't quite remember the details on that we're gonna see nobara we're gonna visit her in the hospital or whatever where she's being reverse curse technique healing right maybe who knows we might see i don't know some more exploration of choso and yuji's brotherly dynamic and what it means to both of them as a relationship we might see toto coping with the loss of his hand we might see I don't know, the other Kyoto school students coping with the loss of Mekamaru. We might see people preparing for the fight against Tsukuno. Like, you know, there are training arts going on here. Yuji has learned producing blood now. We, we could have seen that happen. That could have also been playing into the relationship with Choso. But what do we get instead? We get literally nothing. We jump straight into Gojo versus Tsukuna. And I think the biggest offense here is, okay, if you're a Gojo fan, right? If you were a Gojo fan, when Gojo got unsealed, what were you excited to see? Were you excited to see Gojo hollow purpling all over his enemies? Were you excited to see Infi Infinity stopping the attacks of Sukuna effortlessly? Were you excited to see him fly around and blow everything up and say, you know, yo Aimo or whatever, right? Like, yeah, if you are, fair enough. But you know what I was excited to see when Gojo got revived? I was excited to see him talk to his students after being sealed. I was excited to see him cope with the reality that he had failed and because of that his students had gotten hurt. I was excited to see what would happen if he learned that Megumi was Sukuna now. I was excited to see what would happen when he realized that the principal of Jujutsu High was now dead. I was excited to see how he would react to all of these cool things, not cool things, all of these important developments that happened. And maybe he would go to see Nobara in the hospital too. But you know what we get instead of that? Literally nothing. Literally nothing. Dude, it's Gojo. These are main characters of the show. Why are we getting no focus on their interactions? I don't get it. I simply just don't get it. I think skipping this part of the that like time skip was one of the most insane fumbles that Gege Akutami has made as an author. I have no idea. We just got out of a bunch of fights. You don't need to go straight to the next fight. Like, this is just cool fight simulator at this point. The characters barely matter anymore. It was really frustrating to me as a reader to see that time skip being completely ignored. Anyways, that aside, I can't sit here and tell you the fight wasn't good. The fight was insane. The fight was so cool. So many, oh man, Sukuna is so cool. Gojo is so cool. He summoned Maharaga. He summoned Agito. I'm not drawing Agito. <laughs> it's a ridiculous design. But, you know, just everything happened in that fight. Every domain expansion, I was cheering. I was cheering for Gojo. Was, yes, Gojo, domain expansion on him. Yes. You know, uh, every time Gojo reverse curse technique, woo, healed himself. Oh my goodness, he healed himself. What a, what a goat. You know, just as a fan of both Gojo and Sukuna, I was eating well in that fight. It was awesome. It was so cool to see them, you know, getting their moments, getting their wins over each other. And here's the other thing. This fight really takes the already complicated system of cursed energy and then does a bunch of ridiculous things with it. So it could have been really confusing and impossible to understand. But in my opinion... The author explained it really well. Through the medium of other characters talking about the fight, it was explained well enough that I completely understood everything. Like, not everything, maybe I had to reread a couple things, but it was very clear for so many complicated things happening. Phenomenally written fight, just it frustrated me that it happened right after a bunch of other cool things I could have seen. And while I think off-screening Gojo was a bit of a disrespectful move, I don't think it was the end of the world. I don't think it was the worst thing I've ever read or anything. You know, like... It makes sense. Sukuna has been trying to adapt throughout the whole fight. There are hints throughout telling us this. And also, did you really expect that Gojo would be the one to just kill Sukuna and end the manga there? Like, I mean, of course he was going to lose. I, I went into that fight completely expecting him to lose and cripple Sukuna in some way. 
So, you know, I wasn't too disappointed by the, the death of Gojo, but I can see how you would be because it definitely was pretty disrespectful. And okay, while we're here, let's quickly talk about Takaba versus Kenjaku. I thought it was a fantastic fight. Like I said, I have a lot of love for Takaba, and a lot of that is because of the backstory, the moments that we got to see of him in this fight. And even though it cuts straight from Yuji and Higuruma entering the battlefield against Sukuna to this fight and being like, really? You're going to come from that to this? Like, yes, that was an outrageous moment. But honestly, I think it made up for it. It was a very entertaining fight. They, you know, Takaba is a hilarious guy. His curse technique is very entertaining. And the backstory we got of him made me care about him. You know, he's a, he's a cool guy. And the ending of the fight was pretty satisfying as well. I thought it was a very cool fight. Just the placement made it suffer a little bit. And now we have Sukuna versus literally the entire rest of the cast. Uh, yeah, everyone and their dog is showing up. We've got let let's look at let's look at the picture I've drawn here. We've got Rika and Yuto. We've got Kashimo. We've got Ino. <laughs> yeah, Ino. We've got Kusakabe. We've got Yuji. We've got Choso. We've got Wee Wee of all people. We oh I didn't draw Mei Mei, but she was in the fight too for some time. We've got. Oh god, what's their name? Uh, Kirara, we've got uh, Maki, we've got Higuruma, we've got Miguel and LaRue. Everyone has pulled up in this fight. Wait, I forgot something. Let me talk about Maki real quick. Oh my goodness, I completely forgot. Maki, to me, was a very interesting character originally. However, I feel like Gege kind of just didn't really know what to do with her. And after she killed the Zenin clan, it really felt like another instance of possible cool character development being turned into a cool fight again. Like, yeah, it was awesome to see Maki slaughter her way through the Zenin family. But, like, we don't really get any more moments from her about it, talking about it. Like, no resolution to her, you know, her emotional arc throughout this. Nothing like that. Like, literally nothing. It just kind of happens, and then we don't talk about it again. And, uh, Naoya. Dude, Naoya? And then he comes back as a curse? That was some of the most uninteresting, boring stuff I've read in my entire life. Like, why do I care that Naoya came back as a curse? Why do I care that some random dudes are here to parabolic time chamber Maki and train her to power up and beat the Maki and the Naoya curse? Completely ridiculous nonsense about a character I didn't care about, Naoya, and a character I was slowly and, not even slowly, quickly losing interest in because we didn't get any character moments from her, Maki. And like, I see a lot of memes saying, oh, <laughs> Gege missed Toji, so he just turned Maki into Toji. And I, I wish I could disagree, but it really does feel that way to me sometimes. I think it's a huge shame because Maki had a really cool potential as a character. And to me, she's pretty uninteresting now. She just kind of is Toji. Anyways, back to everyone versus Sukuna. Yeah, man, like, I, I find it really hard to care anymore. Like, it's just like, oh, who's gonna show up next? <laughs> Shoko? Like, it's, it's, it's just ridiculous at this point. I... Since Gojo died, and then immediately Kashimo came in and got beat in one chapter. As a Kashimo fan, that hurt me, man. That that really hurt me. But regardless, just it's just like, I, I feel like the stakes don't matter anymore. It's just like, yeah, whatever. Y Yuji's probably going to come in. Oh, I've unlocked my awakening, the curse technique awakening, domain expansion, uh, lost in paradise. Oh, the song is playing now in the background. I don't know. Like, whatever is going to happen, it's just kind of like, okay, man, I, I, I wish I could care more. I, I really do. But at this point, I know that if a character dies, it won't mean anything because nobody will react to their death. Nobody will reminisce about the times they spent with that character unless it's Gojo and Geto. It really feels like the only interesting relationship that Gege knows how to write is between Gojo and Geto. Because that's the only relationship that we saw a good fleshed out character dynamic that lasted for a long period throughout the series that actually had a bit of a resolution when Gojo died and went to the airport. Uh, and nobody else has had any moments like that. I don't... It's really frustrating to me, because a lot of these characters are really cool, and I like them a lot. A lot of these characters have relationships with other characters that I'm very invested in, and I just get to see none of it, and it makes me so angry and so disappointed. And I, I wish I could care more about Jujutsu Kaisen, but at this point, yes, I'm keeping up with the manga every week, but it's more just because I want to see what happens next because of sunk cost fallacy. Like, I've already caught up to the manga. What's one more chapter a week, right? It's like, and also the memes are pretty funny. There, there, there's some pretty funny memes about the chapters. So, yes. And, okay, I will also say, Miguel and LaRue versus Sukuna did give me a much more enjoyable time than most of the chapters I've been reading recently in JJK. Miguel is a fun guy. He His flashback talking about Gojo was very funny. And... 
it's really, really funny to me that Gojo has now been racist on screen, but that's another matter. Anyways, all that aside, um, yeah, I just wish I could really care more about JJK, but Gege has said stop caring about the characters because they're not going to get anything. As a final retrospective on JJK, I think it's just a lot of really cool ideas that I really resonated with because, I mean, like I said, I really enjoyed watching it for the first time and, you know, getting attached to these characters at first and thinking, wow, these are really cool ideas. You know, this is a really cool world. This is a really cool story. And then a lot of those ideas just not being utilized at all in ways that are satisfying to me. And I wish I could say more positive things about JJK because, I mean, overall, I still did enjoy reading it. But looking back on it, I just, I'm running out of good things to say because it's all just fights. I, I, I wish it was <laughs> more than just fight Jutsu Kaisen, but I mean, you know, I guess the manga is called Sorcery Fight, so what did I expect? Maybe I'm the, maybe I'm the fool here. Regardless, I'm still keeping up with the manga every week, so I guess Gege Akatami is the real winner in all of this if I'm still reading. Feel free to leave a comment if you have anything to say, if you agree or disagree with my comments, and feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more like this. Have a wonderful day.